I am going to follow the Lord this morning. Um, I've been praying about what to preach this morning, and this, this came to my heart this week. I want you to open your Bible to the book of James, if you would. The book of James. And um, by the way, God uses Tim in a way that it, it absolutely amazes me. Um, when he says that he's afraid at times to go and say what he's going to say or to do what he's going to do, I have a hard time believing that. I've never met a man that loves sinners more uh, than Brother Tim. I'm lifting him up because I, I know the battle that he faces. I know the trials that he has. I know the burdens that he carries. Uh, we've spent many a time talking, sharing, confessing faults one to another. So I know this man and I know his heart. There are many ways to do what he's doing. We live in an electronic world. And... I definitely see the hand of the devil on the censorship that is out there. It's funny that all of the newspapers, all of the major news outlets censored and banned anything that had to do with Hunter Biden's laptop. And now all of the news outlets, including CNN, are confessing that the FBI has a very broad investigation against Hunter Biden and the President of the United States. Now I'm going to instruct my daughter, Lindsay, to edit this statement before we upload it to YouTube or they'll probably put another strike against my channel and we can't afford it. And I'll tell you why. I have a lot of opinions about politics. I have a lot of opinions about our country. I have a lot of opinions about what is right and what is wrong. There is nothing more important that should go out of this church than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. They have not so far banned on YouTube, Facebook, any of the outlets that we use, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We used to have a man here uh, several years ago. He would go to... Rome at Easter and hand out gospel tracts to all the Roman Catholics that showed up. And you know what? When the police would come, because it's forbidden to do certain things in Rome because the Roman Catholic Church had such a tie down on that, but when he would tell them that he's giving them verses out of the Bible, the police would let him go and let him do what he was called there to do. There are ways that you can share the gospel. You have email. You have Facebook. You have Twitter. You have those outlets. You have, we have, I don't know how many sermons that we have on disc or DVD. I think sermon audio, um, I think the count on sermon audio since 2011, I think we've probably posted somewhere around 2,600 sermons. On sermon audio since 2011 um, my latest guess at how many sermon downloads we've had since 2011 is somewhere around 15 million downloads of the services and the preaching that comes out of this church not to dismiss the two radio stations that right now God is using in such a mighty way, I can't talk about it yet. I can't tell you what has Michael tied up in Kenya. But I can tell you that it is big. It's probably the biggest thing that God has ever done through this church. 
and I'm rejoicing, and I'm anxious for Michael to get back so I can hear all of what's going on. But it is a critical time in Kenya. It's an election year, as it is here, and a critical time in our country. In the book of James, you see I have up on the screen, I asked Google, Google's becoming a god now because Google knows everything. So I asked Google, actually I asked DuckDuckGo, because I don't like Google anymore. They censor, they censor my, uh, my searches. So I asked DuckDuckGo how many religions there, were, there are in the world. And the website that it pointed me to said that there's probably estimated over 4,000 unique, different religions in the world. If you took Roman Catholicism, which has about 1.2 billion followers around the world, Islam, about a billion followers around the world, Judaism, in the hundreds of millions of followers of Judaism, evangelical or Bible Christianity, churches like us, into the hundreds of millions. And my guess is that if you combine all of those major religions together, you probably have 80% of the entire world that believes that there is a God in heaven and that there is a place of everlasting blessing and a place of everlasting torment. And man must make a decision in this life where he will spend the rest of eternity. As Tim told you, the man had him by the throat. And he said, I could snap your neck now. I could kill you right now. And Tim, God bless you. Because I would have probably fainted, wet myself, and died. But God put it in him and, and he said, you know, if you kill me now, my body will go to the ground, but my soul will go to heaven. Where's your soul going to go when you die? God put that in him. Look at James chapter 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Can I get an amen? This book that we have, this book that we follow, this book that we read, this book that we study, this book that we get our life and our breath and our inspiration from, is not just a reading book. It is a book of instructions on how to live this life in this world. Verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's talking about a mirror. For he beholdeth himself. You know, us men, we spend about 20 seconds in front of a mirror just to make sure our cow licks down, Jim, right? Okay. Or to wipe the bald spot off, make it nice and shiny, All right, Brother Tim? And then we walk away, and the Bible says, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso, verse 25, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and he's not talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, Paul said, was bondage. And Israel is, is reckoned as Hagar and Ishmael. And Hagar was a bond, she was a slave woman. And her son was born into bondage. And Paul said that every one of the Israelites who are born and recognize the Mount Sinai covenant that God made with Israel, they're in bondage to this day. Every Mormon, every Jew, every Roman Catholic, every Muslim, every Shinto, every Buddhist, every Hindu, everybody who worships amongst these 4,000 religions are in bondage because they have a religion that says do. But God has given us a religion that says it's done. 
It is finished. Somebody say amen. It's the perfect law of liberty. It sets men free, even men who, and mankind who live in places where they are in bondage by their government, where they have dictatorial rule. You can be a Christian. In, Paul was a Christian in jail. He was a born-again man singing praises and worshiping God in prison. He had the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Here we go. First and second Thessalonians. You know that song, Tim? Yeah. That's a good song, isn't it? Let me read this to you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10. For by grace are you saved. He mentioned this earlier. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a what? Gift of God. Say it again. Say it again. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And I can tell you that every one of these 4,000 religions that are on this earth that people worship whatever God they do, they boast in what they do. The Muslims don't have a problem falling down five times a day wherever they are and bowing toward Mecca and praying to the devil God that they worship there. They don't have a problem doing that right in your sight. But they are in bondage. And they boast of their works. I have nothing to boast of. I've done nothing except receive God's grace. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now verse 10, for we are his workmanship. That means the way you are right now, Gary, is the way God made you to be. With all of the good things that you are and all of the sins that you've committed, God was in every bit of it to bring you to the salvation that he's given you and to allow you to continue in that salvation. When you die, Gary, where are you going? Amen. If any man among you seem religious, verse 26, now I want you to look at this verse. He was right in what he said about waitresses. Melissa, was he right? My sister used to be a waitress at a restaurant in this town. And she worked the Sunday crowd who got out of church and went and sat at the restaurant and complained the food wasn't right and slammed the plates down on the table, threw a fit, and said, I ain't, I ain't giving her nothing. That's evil. That's wicked. Waitresses don't make the minimum wage that other people make. It's, their income is gained by tips. And God has taught me to tip well. Forget about 15%. Give them a $50 bill. They got to pay a mortgage. They got to raise children. They got to feed their family. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, are you catching where I'm going? James has spoken in this book about the tongue and how evil our mouth is and now in the world of instantaneous messaging we not only use our mouth but we use our hands to send out messages that are in condemnation of people critical of people chastising people and we have a forked tongue when we speak we blast everybody else's sins and neglect our own. 
If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now, I was with a guy one time, and he was a guy that went to church here years ago. We thought about trying to set up a stand somewhere where we could give out our DVDs. So he called a, a place, it was a business place, and they had little kiosks there in the walkways, and they had them for rent. And he was talking to somebody on the phone and asking them if we could have, if we could rent one of those to, for our ministry. And the lady said, is this a church or is this some, some kind of religion because we don't allow that? And he told the woman, no, it's not about religion. And I just cringed when he said that. It was a lie. I am a religious man. I have a religion that I believe in, that I live by, a strong faith that I will not deny to any man. Somebody say amen. Churches have made religion a bad word or have drugged the word religion through the mud of churchianity, sins in the church, wickedness inside the church, and the world in this country would not give you two cents for a box full of preachers. But I have a religion, and the religion that I have is called pure religion. Look at verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Now, I like that statement. Tim, you take that verse to the next Mormon word you go to. Undefiled before God and the Father. Who would God be in that sentence? Jesus Christ. Is Jesus God Almighty? I heard you. Brother Cooley. Amen. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. It is not for us as a church to receive gifts from people. It is our responsibility as a church to give gifts to people who need it. Somebody say amen. If somebody needs an electric bill paid, we'll pay it. If strangers come by needing gas money, we'll take them down to the gas station, fill their car up with gas. Sometimes if I can detect that they're looking for drug money, I won't give it to them. I had a lady come by one day, and she was asking for money, and I was just about to give it to her, but she opened her mouth, and I could see her teeth were all rotted out, and I'm going, she's on meth. And so I told her, I said, ma'am, I'm not going to give you any money today. I'm sorry I can't help you. And I tried to witness to her and I prayed with her. You know what? She came back six months later. She came back, D, six months later. Because she knew what she was going to do with the money I was going to give her. And I knew it too. She came back and she showed me. She lifted her pant leg up, showed me the ankle monitor she had. She said, I just got out of prison. I did six months. I've been addicted to methamphetamine. She said, I'm trying to get my life straightened out and I've got a job interview up at St. Louis and I don't have the money to get up there. I brought her in here and I prayed with her. We gave her a Bible, took her down the gas station, filled her tank up, gave her some DVDs. I haven't seen her since. They always promise they're going to come to church here. They never do. But if I give them a gift in anticipation that we're going to receive from them their blessing by coming here and filling the pews for us then it's not really a gift i paid for them to come but if i give it to them without any expectation of return then i've done exactly what god told us to do to love people and to give to them without expecting something back somebody say amen to visit the fatherless and the widows 
bears in mind the two commandments that Jesus gave us in the New Testament. The, the second one was this, to love your neighbor as yourself, and, and that is bound up in to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. To love people who have nobody else to love them. To give to people and to be with people and fellowship with people who have no friends anymore, who've lost their husbands, lost their wives, lost their parents. People need fellowship and they need to be loved by somebody. Somebody say amen. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now I got a whole sermon on that part right there. I'm not going to preach it yet. But to be unspotted, it references going back to the Old Testament law where if a man showed up with sores on his skin, he was to go to the priest who was instructed to look and, and monitor the spread of the sore on his skin to see if it was leprosy. And after about seven days, I think, he would come back to the priest, and if the priest saw that the spot was, they called it a spot, if he saw that the leprosy was growing, he declared that person unclean. And you know what that person had to do? They were not allowed to come in the city anymore. They were not allowed to be around people except they had to walk and, and announce unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away from them and not be affected by their leprosy. I saw a man that I've known since I was a teenager. A man who used to be prominent in this county. I won't say how. Standing on the corner in Hillsboro holding a sign ordered by a judge that he was a wife abuser and his sentence was he had to stand and hold a sign all day long and announce to the world what he had done. How would you like that? How would you like your name showing up on a sex offender registry? How would you like the paper to write the story of what you did and how you lived and what church you went to while you were doing it? Listen, I know that fighting sin is the hardest thing that we ever do. There is nothing more difficult than for us to fight the needs and the desires and the lusts of our flesh. And I know that fight. How do we keep ourselves unspotted? First, don't commit the sin. Don't do it. Don't say it. Don't think it. Don't act on it. Don't do it. But if you do, we have an advocate with the judge. His name is Jesus Christ. And he stands at the right hand of the Father. And you know what he does? He hears our confession. You remember Bradley Crum used to come here? He was an ex-Mormon. He was this close to going on the mission. He came over here one Sunday morning, still part of the Mormon church, and he said, they're about to throw me out. I said, why? He said, I've got a girlfriend that's not a Mormon, and he said, they're going to throw me out. And he said something to me I never knew before. He said, when I went to the whoever it was there and, and confessed my sins, and I went, Arr! you did what? 
He said, we have to confess our sins to, I don't know who it was he said at the, at the Mormon place there in Hillsboro, but he said, we have to confess our sins to him. And I looked right at him, and God put this word to my mouth, and I said, I guarantee you, you didn't tell him everything, did you? And he said, no. I said, why? He said, because I'm ashamed. I said, but you can tell God. We can go boldly before the throne of grace and find help and mercy in our time of need. If we didn't have a God whose mercy was everlasting, then what God do we have? We have a pure religion that not only helps us stay away from sin, but forgives us when we fail so that now we still are unspotted. Somebody say amen. And that's what this religion is about. It's not about politics. It's not about right wing, left wing, center. It's not about all of that junk. It is about the forgiveness of your sins so that you don't have to spend eternity in the lake of fire. Somebody say amen. That's our religion. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't cower down about it. If somebody brings up religion, maybe God sent them to you so that you could give them truth instead of the lies that they heard on the internet. I want to pray for you, Brother Tim. I've looked up to you for years. I have a list of men in my life that God has given me. Most were preachers. That from a young age, I sat in this church, in those pews, and I watched the men who stood behind these pulpits. And every one of them, I've modeled part of me after them. Brother Randy Casey is one of them. He's preached here several times. I looked up to him when I was in school over there. And part of me came from him. Part of what I do now came from Brother Tim and Brother Al. So that as he's getting old and decrepit and can't get around very good and starts losing his mind a little bit and can't talk and like our president, <laughs> then God has supplied someone to follow behind him and walk in his footsteps. And every young person in this church is looking up to you adults here. I know that because I was them. Don't you dare hurt them. Let them follow in your footsteps. As we go to glory, they come behind us sharing the same gospel that we shared.